Okay. <laughs> so on 157, we are now going to meet the Aeneans, those that are a part of the crew and people following the Aeneas, in the aftermath. We've already had everything calmed down and cleaned up by Neptune. So now we talk about the Aeneadae, those are Aeneas' men, and they are referred to as the Defesi. So I would definitely be one of those. So the tired Aeneadae, they contendunt, they tendo tendere, they stretch. But when you stretch, you can also strive, and so you can understand it strive. So they strive to seek the litora, the shores. Remember, if something is described as littoral, it is indicating that it lives on a coast or a seashore. So crabs would be littoral, and seashells would be littoral. It is from litus littoris, meaning that it is, of course, neuter, plural, and accusative in this instance. So they strive to seek the shores, which, and then imply some, are closest. So if you're trying to survive and make landfall and you're swimming, you're not like, I'm going to hit that beach way over there. No, you're going to go in a straight line, as fast as you can, to get on dry land. So they seek the shores, which are closest, and they do so cursu. Now this is from curo curare, curare cursus. And remember, you can take that fourth principal part, and you can turn it into a noun. And so it means in their course or in their run, because that's what it originally comes from. So in their course, in their route, they seek the shores which are closest, and... They are turned. Huerto, huertere. Now, a word about huerto and tor. When I say they are turned, it sounds as though like the hand of one of the gods come down and turned. But here, this is what is known as a medio passive verb. So, in language Indo European expressions, we have active, subject does the action. You have passive, subject acted upon. But there's also what is known as the middle voice, or sometimes you can refer to it as the medial passive. And what that means is that the subject is acting upon itself. Think of it in terms of a vector force, and this is how my linguist professor described it to me. When it is active, think of the action as a vector that is emanating out from the subject, Whereas if it is middle, or if it is passive, think about it as a vector in which it is directed upon the subject. Either if the subject is acted upon, or as the subject is acting upon itself. Now we're going to come later to see that whenever we have a middle sense of a voice, the middle voice, not active, not passive, but middle voice, you will also have what is known as a Greek accusative of respect with it, not here. So it's not that they are turned, but more so, they turn themselves. If I tell a student who is yapping to the person behind them, turn around, what am I literally telling them? I'm telling them, turn yourself around. And so that way we use the middle voice as well, the medial passive. They are turned, they turn themselves, to the shores, and that's another word for shore. You have litus, which is up here, and you have also aura, which we have seen, to the shores of Lydia. So this is where they're going to make landfall. Now, it's at this point we have what is referred to as an ekphrasis. Ekphrases, ekphrasis, and some people would argue that this is not an ekphrasis, but usually an ekphrasis is a detailed description of artwork within literature. Well, this isn't artwork, but it is the actual scene, the topography, an extended description therein, in which we are going to find out exactly where it is and what it is like in this location to where they have made landfall. And that starts right here in 159. So he says, There is a place in a long secession. That would be like a recession or a seclusion, if you would like. And an island, insula, makes facio facere fecchi factus. Remember the I replaces the A whenever you put the prefix EX. And an island makes a port by the obstruction Objectu, by the throwing down of its sides, latus lateris. Now, don't worry, I'm going to draw a picture in just a moment to show you what this is and how it looks. So again, an island makes a port by the obstruction of its sides. 
by, with, because of, from. One of the things that drives me nuts the most is when students see a keyword, a click my code, and the words who or which come out of the mouth. No! Look to see what case it is. Cases matter. On which, I would think would be good here, the onus unda, the whole C, really it's a wave, but the wave representing the C as a whole, on which the whole C is broken from the deep, and that whole wave skinned it. Skindo skindere. We got that in Eke Romani. Cuts itself into folds or laps, bays, having been led back. So, hopefully you'll be able to see, I'm going to move you slightly, this picture that I'm going to draw. So I wish I had more room, but I'm going to put it right here so that hopefully you'll be able to make it out. So it says there is a place in a long succession. Now think of this as the shoreline, and a secession or recession would kind of be like that inlet that you have. So here's the water, and so the water is going to be in here as well. So again, on which, no, no, and an island makes a port by the obstruction of its side. So that island would be located right here. Now, why is that island going to help create a port situation in this inlet that you have, this Sekesu? Because as the waves come crashing in, they hit this island, do you see, by the obstruction of its sides, and then the wave energies go off to the side, making the water that is in the inlet calm, and that's how it's making a port. In order for something to be a port, to park your ship, you can't have the waves constantly rocking. You need calm waters. And that's what makes a harbor a harbor. And that's why it also says, and all of the wave, all of the ocean, is broken from the deep, on which, which is the sides of that island, and it cuts itself into folds. And that's what sinus sinus is. Now, a sinus, and I don't know if you can see me, I'm going to make it to where you can here, is that I'm about to create a sinus. The word sinus can mean like a harbor or a bay, but it can also mean like your lap or your bosom. So when you sit down, and hopefully you can see me, when you sit down, and do you see when I squanch over, now I've created a lap, and it's exactly that same sort of squishing that is up in my picture. Think of it as this being my knees being pulled up to my stomach. Do you see? And so that's why a sinus can be a fold that you create, or it's the fold or the lap that's created here. So hopefully you can make out what I'm trying to display. So obviously, is it understandable? Mm -hmm. So that's my knees, that's my stomach. And when I sit down, I create a lap. That would be my lap right there. But in this case, it's talking about the harbor or the bay. And so, again, it cuts itself into bays or laps, laps having been led back, reductos, as it were. So, let's go on. In the next slides, I'm going to leave my drawing up for reference points. And so we continue with the description. So, hink, aqua, hink. So from over here, that's what hink means, and from over here, and what we are describing is going to be both of the sides. See, land over here and land over here. So from over here and from over here, so both this side and that side, and I used brown to indicate land, wastai rupes. Remember, rupes are crags, cliffs, these rocks, outcroppings, and menacing, the other word for crags, and that's what Gemini doesn't mean menacing, but, but, but twin crags. So vast crags, outcroppings of rock, and twin cro or outcroppings of rock, minantor, rise menacingly, is what that verb means, or rises up, into the sky. So if you're sailing your boat, the walls of the cliffs would be towering above you on both sides. Under the vertex of which, remember, you can't just say who or which. It has to go with what case, and what case is it? 
genitive. And so you don't say of which first. It's under the high point, under the vertex of which, meaning those crag walls, I quarter tuta. The word tuta means safe. Safe seas become silent and they do so widely. Why are they safe seas? Remember back here, calm waters, safe seas. Why is it silent? You've been to the beach before. If you're on the beach, you're constantly hearing the noise of the water, right? Some of you probably have things like on your phone or, or, or Alexa, you just want to go to sleep. You're saying, if you have an Alexa, that's what we have in my house. Alexa, play soothing ocean noises. And then you fall asleep with the waves. Okay, that, maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, so safe seas widely, la tu sa means wide, but that's with the e widely, they become silent. And then he describes it even further. This scene, this harbor port of Carthage. Then, the skyna. The skyna is going to be the backdrop. So the crags and the scopoli were on both sides, these outcroppings that rise straight up into the air. The backdrop is going to be the back part here, and that's what the sky is, why we get the word scene, as in scenery in a movie or play, with forests. But they are koruskis, gleaming, glittering forests, shimmering even. So here you have a bunch of trees in the backdrop that is here, from above. And there's no verb, because we're just describing it. And so he's just saying this, and then this, not, and you could just imply it, there is. And so then a backdrop with shimmering forests from above. Que and an atrum nemus. Now the word nemus comes from nemus nemoris, so that is neuter of the third declension, and it means a grove. And it's modified by ater atra atrum, which remember hopefully it means the dark grove. And what makes a grove dark is that obviously you're in the forest and no sunlight is getting through the trees. A dark forest, imminent, hangs overhead. If something is imminent, that means it is hanging overhead. I don't know why it did that. I apologize. Let me see if I fix it. There we are. With a shadow. But the kind of shadow that it is is a horrenti umbra. With horrid shadow. Spooky shadow, if you would so want. So, it's kind of a creepy place back here. Kind of dark. Kind of silent, or silent, quiet. Too quiet, maybe. And then, sub fronte adversa. Now remember that word, adversa means face on, head on. And that would be the word for the face, fronte, like front. So we're talking about the straight head on, I suppose. And so under the straight head on, there is an antrum. Again, you just supply an S. An antrum is a cave, and it is a cave with hanging rocks. Now what kind of rocks would be the hanging rocks that you would see in a cave? Why that would be stalactites. Remember, stalactites are the rocks that are formed from the dripping calcium and whatnot that hang down, if you've ever been in a cave, and then the stalagmites are the ones that come from below. And Sometimes you see they actually grow together. And so there's a cave with hanging rocks. Intus, inside there are Aquae dulces, sweet water. So back here, into the cliffs that are rising to the air. So if you're sailing your boat, there would be these walls of cliffs on either side. And then all of a sudden, you would look up, and there would be a hole. Kind of like you've ever seen the movie Castaway. How there's a cave he kind of hangs out in that comes out of the water. And so, or out of the rocks uh, right upon the water. And so inside, sweet waters. Now what makes the water sweet in this area or situation? Well, the fact that they're not salt water, fresh water, would make them sweet. Que and sedilia seats, sedes, sedilia seats with saxa wo wiwo. That wiwo sa means living or alive, with living rock. Now, what makes the rock living in a cave? Well, the fact that it's always growing, frankly. Those stalactites and stalagmites are constantly getting longer and bigger, until eventually, like I said, the stalactites and the stalagmites will often meet together, as it were. And so, it is an incredibly tranquil scene that where they now have made refuge with some people of the 20 ships have recovered, and actually 19 of the 20 make it. One did not because it was eaten up 
by a, a, a whirlpool, per se. And it's then called, this little cave in its serene setting, the House of the Nymphs. That's like where nymphs would hang out. And here, long eye, Winkula. That would be chains. So here, chains do not hold, and it's known, Ula, Winkula. Not any chains hold tired ships. So if your ship parked right here, you do not even need to be anchored. And that's because it is so calm and so serene. And an anchor, the Ancora, that you can see that it's there, known alligat does not bind. Aligo alligare, bind is in like an alligator. It does not bind, imply those ships, with its hooked unco morsu bite. And that's where we get the word morsel from, morsus morsus. And so, in the way that it is described, a perfect spot for all of these injured, all of these battered, all of these limping ships of Aeneas, all 20 of them. And let me read it a little bit more, I suppose, to right here, and then we'll call it a day. To this place, hook, so you remember from making money, hook a -look, to this place, Aeneas subit. Now, let's talk about subit, especially in this context. It is from the verb, eo irae. And sub, of course, means under, so to go under, subit, subire, it also means to support. But in this context of sailing, subit is always going to mean to dock, essentially, to park the ship. And so, to this place, Aeneas puts in, would be a nautical term, and you put in, you dock, and then put out, not in the, 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 the vulgar sense, means to set the sail, put out to sea. And so Aeneas, to this place, docks with his ships, with his seven ships, having been collected omni ex numero, from the whole number. So I said 19 survived, and I do know this, but Aeneas only has seven. So where are the other 12? He doesn't know. We will find out that they've made landfall safely somewhere else, but when everything is so disaster in a storm of that magnitude, everybody is going to be separated and have to maybe come back together at a certain point. So as far as Aeneas knows, all those other guys, not 13 others, he knows one of them is a goner because it was gobbled up by a whirlpool, but 12 of them, he has no idea if they survived or not. Wait, so was it a whole ship or just one dude? Whole ship's worth. Okay. So lots of ships. So he's got seven. So Aeneas docks with seven ships having been collected from the whole number, which was 20, remember, and... Magno Amore, with a large love of the land, as you can imagine, if you've been in a storm on a ship, you would kiss the ground, with a large love of the land, they, the ones having gone out, a grady or a grady, a grisisum, it is deponent, and so therefore we have to say having verb instead of having been verb. so and they, meaning these people on the ship, the sailors, having gone out with a great love of the land, they potient tour. Now, I made a video, and I don't know if you've watched it, but that is one of those five verbs that are deponent who take ablative objects. Utor uti usisum, fruor frui fructusum, fungor fungi functusum, wescor weski weskitasum, and potior potiri potitasum. It, instead of taking an accusative direct object, it takes an ablative object. And this one means to control or possess. So they, the Trojans, having gone out with a great love of the land, they possess the ablative sand, Horena. And it's not any sand, the optata. Opta optare means to opt for, to wish for, to choose. So the Trojans possess the sand having been desired, having been opted for, having been wanted. And those Trojans, et, and... They place, they put, their accusative, plural, fourth declension, limbs. Your artus or your limbs. They place their limbs. Now, the word tebentes is interesting. It is a present active participle. It can mean either to drip or to melt. Now, I like both of those senses because they would be limbs dripping with salt. Obviously, the salt water that's coming off of them. But why do I like also possibly those limbs melting with salt? 
Because I don't know if you've ever had exercising to where, let's say you're working on your legs and lifting weights with your legs or running until you can't run anymore and you get the jelly legs and it feels as though you can't, you know, even hardly stand. I know that I've had that experience. You know, like really, to where all of a sudden your legs like go out from under you. And you, that, that is what they would be like. That's why their limbs are melting. It feels like they're on fire. So their limbs melting with salt, they place them on the shore. They're incredibly, incredibly tired, incredibly grateful that they don't have to obviously undergo that anymore. And they finally found safety on dry land. So that's where we'll stop for that.